Hello everyone, Ultimate Steve here, and today I'll be showing you a very special mission indeed. A new world record for the lowest mass Grand Tour mission in Kerbal Space Program. This mission, a collaboration between Proxima and myself, is called The Wanderer, and has a liftoff mass of 7,719 kilograms, or 7,674 kilograms without the crew. The record had been previously held by Bradley Westance with the 25.1 ton Acuna GT, then by Proxima with the 14.4 ton Chaotic Ambition, and finally by myself with the 11.4 ton Magnum Opus 2. The collaboration started all the way back in February when, shortly after completing my previous Grand Tour record, I discovered a way to save a few hundred kilograms off of the Evelander, mostly by removing the fairing. On the forums, I expressed my interest in collaborating with someone else on a new Grand Tour mission, as I wouldn't have the time to complete it all myself given my responsibilities with college. Proxima reached out to me on Discord shortly after seeing the message, and we decided to combine our talents, tricks, and time to beat the record by over three and a half tons. Before we start, I would like to talk about the difference between a trick and an exploit. After much consideration, a large spreadsheet, and consultation with several other players, I have determined that there is no line between a trick and an exploit, just a sea of grey. I can say only two things concretely. One, I believe every trick in this mission has been accepted as valid on at least one previous world record mission, and two, that we as a community should disclose all tricks used in an obvious way. Throughout the video, I will be talking about what we have done to reduce the mass of each phase of the mission, what could be done to reduce the mass in the future, as well as what tricks were used in each phase. I will also keep a running total of how many gravity assists have been used, as well as how much mass we estimate can be taken off of this record with currently understood methods. With that out of the way, the most obvious changes to the ascent vehicle have to do with mass and drag optimizations. The rapier engine is now shielded from drag, and the wings are just basic fins now, as the craft is light enough to not need anything bigger. The basic fins also burn off after they are no longer needed, which decreases drag and mass at higher altitudes. The payload is also much more cleanly compacted without excessively part clipping. Thus, the fairing can be made much smaller, saving a lot of mass. The second major change is that the rapier engine and associated fuel tanks are detached at the end of the jet phase. This means we no longer have to push the rapier engine all the way to lathe or even all the way to orbit. It was found that a dedicated lathe lander is lighter than the fuel needed to push the rapier all the way to lathe and then most of the way off of lathe. So it no longer makes sense to base the lathe lander off of the rapier engine. The required rocket kick to get to orbit is instead revived by the Eve lander's twitch engines. As with the previous record, the final push to orbit is done by the single ion engine. Something else you may notice is that it's just bill this time. The too kerbal nature of the previous mission was because I didn't know that the commonly accepted rules for low mass records includes a setting that allows engineers to also use maneuver nodes. As for possible savings in the ascent phase, I can't really put a number on that due to several factors, but it will be significant. Most obviously, every improvement later on will reduce the fuel required to make it to orbit, so I can't really put a number on this. So all of the post-jet phase mass will be tallied rather than the total mass savings. If mass to orbit is decreased enough, an alternate method to reach orbit may be worthwhile. That is very tempting, as the mass of the rapier engine is now over a quarter of the total mass at liftoff. Proxima estimates that the break-even point for using whiplash is somewhere between 5 and 6 tons liftoff mass, so this will probably not happen for a while. The other major improvement is that someone has found a way to reliably use the EVA construction tool to assemble propellers. I don't know what this method is, all I know is that it exists. The major constraint on the shape and size of the fairing until now has been propeller diameter, so removing this constraint would allow the craft to fit inside a much lighter fairing, firstly just due to the square cube law as the fairing approaches the sphere, and secondly depending on how much part clipping is used. Proxima estimates that this could save around 200 kilograms of fairing mass. She also believes that the engine plate allowing zero drag may not be worth it, as the added lift could outweigh the drag. This could save up to 58 kilograms. Other minor upgrades include burning all of the engines at the same time for greater thrust, or burning just the ant engines for increased specific impulse, whichever ends up helping more. The math has not been done yet. More optimization can probably be done to the ascent profile, both to decrease losses and to increase the portion of work done by the ion engine. Since the thrust of the ion engine is fixed, and this record will probably always need an ion engine, any mass saved after this point also has knock-on effects here too, as the thrust rate ratio and therefore the portion of the ascent that can be ion-powered will increase, leading to decreased reliance on rockets. I will not put numbers on these improvements just yet though, as they are not very concrete. In addition, the ion engine can also be started a little bit earlier, as there is an altitude at which a specific impulse exceeds the specific impulse of the rapier engine. This will not save very much fuel, because the ion engine will burn very little xenon in that time, and its specific impulse is only better by about a third, but I thought I would at least mention it seeing as it does not require very much effort. Before the periapsis kicks, the empty tanks, the extra solar panels, and other ascent hardware is detached using the EVA construction tool. Another small amount of xenon could be saved by EVA detaching these while the ion engine is still burning for orbital insertion. I would wager a guess and say that the transfer to Joule cannot be significantly improved. Proxima is a gravity assist wizard, both in the minimal xenon she needed to get everything set up, and in the huge amount of patience needed to set up the insane number of gravity assists it took. The Mun and Minmus landings were not done until later, uh, partially due to how deeply buried inside the craft the necessary hardware was, and partially due to the minimal xenon the gravity assist to return here would take. 
The parking orbit for this mission was chosen to be elliptical tidal orbit, and I think the reason for doing so was lost in translation. After trying both, I definitely prefer elliptical lathe orbit because it simplifies logistics by allowing aero capture. The craft unfolds using hinges to allow clean decoupling of each of the individual landers, which looks really cool, but unfortunately I did not get video of them deploying because of a part routing issue. By the time I had figured out a proper route for decoupling everything, I had deleted the footage of the deployment and I forgot to retake it. The craft's part tree was such that a lot of stuff had to be taken off in order to get at the ion engine inside, and there was a point where I was concerned we would have to restart the mission entirely, but it worked out in the end. One consequence of this was that we decided to disassemble the Duna lander and reassemble it later. Apparently MechJev units have no EVA assembly hitbox, so the Duna lander's MechJev unit could not be moved. That does mean that the cubic strut it was attached to was unnecessary ultimately. All three hinges can also be designed out, although they do look very cool. Uh, the decoupler for the Duna lander, as it can be disassembled and reassembled later, is also unneeded. At this time I still believe both other decouplers are needed, but that may change in the future. While Bill is reassembling and maneuvering, I suppose I should talk about one of the major tricks you are going to notice throughout this mission, EVA refueling. When you board command pods in Kerbal Space Program, the EVA jetpack gets refueled. The fuel from nowhere is easily abstracted away when the command pods are very heavy and the added fuel mass is very minimal. However, when the inventory system was added, this behavior got ported over to the 20 kilogram conformal storage unit, which provides the same intended stock behavior, but is too light for the same abstraction to work. Getting out and pushing has been a staple of Kerbal Space Program advice, Okay, so I'm going to pause here for a second and just uh, relay this bit of advice. Uh, for some reason, you cannot pick up the root craft of a, a vessel with EVA construction tool unless it is debris. So if you want to pick up the root part of a craft and combine it with another craft, uh, you will need to go to the tracking station and rename it as a piece of debris. Uh, this is not advertised anywhere. I think I found it out completely by accident. Uh, back to the video. But taking to the extreme, everything except for Kerbin, Eve, Lathe, and Tylo can be done using this technique by carrying a container or airlock along with you but most people agree that this is too far to be accepted in an official record. My personal take is that this can be used to refuel the jetpack for multiple uses, but should not be used to go further than you could on one jetpack in one maneuver, and should not be used for getting out and pushing. Proxima's take is that the distinction lies on whether or not the mission would also be possible using multiple jetpacks stashed on the mothership, retrieved and used successively instead of refueled. But there is not an exact community consensus on this just yet. Either way, this mission will use the storage unit to refuel the EVA jetpack and cylinders a few times, but always after returning to the main ship. As you can probably tell, I am regretting taking only one of the smallest batteries by now, as I will need to do many burns to push the heavy Tylo lander into low Tylo orbit. So let's talk about Tylo. The most obvious change is that we are landing on Tylo's tallest mountain, which is not on the equator. The slightly higher amount of fuel required to reach an elliptical orbit is more than offset by the lower gravity losses from a landing and takeoff location nearly 13 kilometers up, corresponding to about 4.2% lower gravity compared to a location at zero altitude, although typical equatorial landing sites tend to be around 5 kilometers up. This means that the landing has to be very precise, and that level of precision is currently incompatible with using the EVA construction tool to jettison empty tanks. When I did that in the previous record, it was more to demonstrate that it could be done, uh, but it wasn't really practical as the gravity losses from the time spent not burning could be more than the delta V saved by shedding dead wheat depending on how long it took. That method is also currently incompatible with selecting a precise landing site because the amount of time it can take can vary significantly. Due to the increased precision requirements, MechJev Smart ASS will be used to control pits for this landing. Due to the high repeatability this resulted in, this allowed me to trim both the ascent and descent margins to razor thin levels. However, the descent fuel tank got filled up to increase margin, and given perfect piloting, the mass of the lander can be decreased by 76 kilograms, purely by lowering the fuel levels in the descent tanks. However, the lowest I've successfully landed with, in practice, uses 10 kilograms more than the theoretical minimum. The lander itself uses two ant engines and one spider engine, and the descent profile involves using MechJev's SFL- feature to adjust my pitch so that I stay at roughly at the altitude of the landing site. The drop tanks are decoupled when empty. Although my targeting and suicide burn skills can be significantly improved, the Tyler lander successfully touches down with about 40 meters per second remaining in the descent tank. To prepare for ascent, the lander must first be righted, which involves rotating one of the engines and using it to set the craft back upright. This will have to be done even in case of an upright landing, as detaching the descent tank will for some reason cause the flag landing gear to click through the surface of the Tylo and tip over. One of the two engines is also detached at this time, as it's effectively dead wheat. The ascent proceeds in a standard manner, pitching over just before engine cutoff to get a small boost from the ejector feature of the EVA seat. This could be further optimized by mounting the seat vertically, negating the need to waste time in fuel flipping, although if flying manually, this would significantly increase the difficulty of the ascent. Another optimization is to lower the thrust on or shut off the spider towards the end of the burn to increase specific impulse. 
For the same reasons described earlier, using the EVA construction tool to jettison the ant and rely on just the spider to lower dry mass would be possible, but of dubious use due to the aforementioned losses. Doing this would increase delta V, but would also require EVA constructing the tile lander, as there would no longer be any valid root parts on the ascent stage for vehicle assembly building based construction. The rest of the ascent is a standard magic hand assisted jetpack ascent. I would have talked about Magic Hand earlier, but doing so would have meant I would have had to play the gravity assist in real time to keep my commentary synchronized to the on-screen action, and that would be boring. When transferring an item from one inventory slot to another, the item's mass does not count towards either inventory, and the item is effectively massless until placed in an inventory. By holding onto the item, you can negate its mass during maneuvers. We both believe that this is the cheesiest trick used in this mission. Either way, uh, the effect of this trick is fairly limited and is not really scalable, so moderately extending the range of the EVA jetpack and slightly increasing lander thrust weight ratio and delta V are just about uh, the most egregious things this can be used for. In this case, the tidal lander is 40 kilograms lighter by magic handing the jetpack through the descent and the first part of the ascent. Once the EVA phase starts, the jetpack swaps places with the cylinders and is burned into depletion. The cylinders are then swapped in to complete the rest of the orbital insertion. SAS is turned off just before orbit is reached to prevent it from using the fuel reserved to run the when the camera flips. As for ascent optimizations, I have not done the math just yet, but it might be worth not bringing the EVA cylinders along, as 20 kilograms of extra fuel might be useful more than 20 kilograms of EVA fuel, although there isn't really any extra space for the fuel in the current tile lander tanks. The EVE lander also uses the cylinders, so they would have to be removed from both landers to make any difference. Some fuel can also be trimmed off of the ascent stage as well, as a full 0.22 EVA propellant was left at the end of the rendezvous. Now some of you are laughing at me, but that is actually plenty of margin, because I only used about uh, 0.1 to make the rendezvous total. If a way is found to land upright and jettison the descent tank, possibly by landing hard enough to destroy the descent tank while keeping the ascent tank intact, in such a way where the flags can still keep the craft upright, the fuel needed to right the lander can also be saved. The EVA jetpack can also be used more intelligently by using better orientation and better use of the 2 and 3 axis thrust modes, but that requires a lot of math and skill. Collectively, these improvements are worth at least 10 kilograms, probably more, but I cannot put an exact number on this for now. Now that most of the tricks requiring explanation have been explained, and because the tidal lander was probably the thing I put the most effort into, and because the island landings can't really be optimized much, the rest of this video should proceed much faster. Proxima is back in the pilot seat for the rest of the jewel landings. Originally, I was supposed to fly this leg, but college rarely respects such time commitments. There isn't much to say about the valve leg besides the fact that 5 kilograms and some minor xenon can be saved with better battery selections. The Z1000 is a very convenient form factor for this mission, but having 5 Z400s and 4 Z100s, excluding batteries needed for the lathe and eve landers, is likely the best arrangement, as due to Jess in order, some later legs were flown with more battery mass than needed. Proxima does incorporate a slight improvement by landing on a tall mountain. There is a nearly 8 kilometer tall mountain, 20 degrees south, and it would likely be an improvement given how much a vowel costs in gravity losses, but would also mean plane changes would have to be performed, which are not free. This would likely not save very much xenon, though, and if every annoying trick was included, no record would ever be beaten. Perfect is the enemy of good. The lathe lander was pretty much exclusively proximate design, using a propeller as the landing stage and the first ascent stage, an ant and spider stage as the second stage, and a magic-handed jetpack as the third stage, with no cylinders. After the ship is reconfigured for lathe, a direct transfer and error capture is used, followed by aero braking, followed by a propeller landing. Ascent is, as mentioned before, battery-driven propellers, followed by an ant and spider stage. This stage is fairly similar to the final stage of the tidal lander, and many of the same optimizations apply. The thrust limiter on the spider can be lowered towards the end of the burn to increase average specific impulse. The adductor seat can be used to give the curve a boost, especially as the seat is already oriented correctly for that in order to reduce drag and the reserve fuel for rendezvous can be decreased if ascent precision and accuracy can be increased, although this is harder to do on lathe than it was on Tylo. EVA jetpack usage optimizations also may apply if one is patient enough to use them. These refinements can allow fuel to be drained from the final stage, which in turn means the propeller stage can get higher, which means less fuel in the ascent stage, etc. I conservatively estimate that at least 25 kilograms can be saved this way, likely more. Proxima also has some comments about the lathe lander. The propeller uses a space-saving technique where the game is saved and loaded at a high RPM so that the propeller permanently expands outwards, providing a greater tip velocity while fitting into a smaller fairing. It is battery-powered but has a small solar panel so it can progressively hop to a mountain tall enough to reach its maximum altitude from. As for the lack of EVA cylinders, due to the final stage's low thrust-to-weight ratio, the extra 20 kilograms hurts more than it helps. This might be the case with the EVE and the Tylo lander as, as well, but the math has not been done yet. Next up are Pole and Bach. The landers for Pol, Bop, Elu, Drez, the Mun, Minus, and Gilly are essentially the same. 
the ion engine, the small reaction wheel, a tank of xenon, the EVA chair, the small solar panel, and below without the jetpack or cylinders form the core of this lander, with the number of batteries being adjusted depending on how demanding each landing is. Barring a major revolution in grant technology, or a major change in which tricks are considered acceptable to use, this lander design will remain the optimal one for the foreseeable future. The quote Proxima used for the introduction of the music video is, Perfection is attained, not when there is nothing more to add, but when there is nothing more to remove. This is the only lander in this whole mission besides the slightly different Moho lander, which I would bet on there being actually nothing else to remove. Every part serves a critical purpose. That's not to say that nothing else can be improved, however, as certain piloting techniques can slightly decrease the amount of xenon needed. However, the effort to reward ratio on these tricks is very poor, so they are not currently worth pursuing in my opinion. If you manage to save 100 meters per second of delta-v on the Tyler lander ascent vehicle, that's likely at least 50 kilograms of fuel saved total on the ascent and descent stages, plus less xenon required to tug it to low Tyler orbit. If you save 100 meters per second during any of the ion landings, or across every ion landing combined, that's only 2 kilograms of xenon plus the equivalent mass of the xenon tank. Such micro-xenon optimizations include better trajectory planning, only taking exactly the amount of xenon needed so you aren't wasting extra xenon pushing around the xenon you don't need, always landing on the Kerbal's head to save maybe 10 meters per second each landing uh, through litho braking, and landing on the highest equatorial mountain on every world to reduce gravity losses. I do not intend to pursue any of them unless a good opportunity comes up by chance, but especially as there's not much else to talk about during ion landings, I thought I would mention them. Thus, while xenon usage can be reduced, I do not believe that the dry mass of any of these landers can decrease from my previous Grand Tour record. The current record, as mentioned earlier, uses slightly suboptimal battery choices, so this one can be improved. If any improvement in dry mass is made, it is likely to be a 5kg reduction in battery mass gained by combining all of the previously listed optimizations. This optimization would not even count for the mission as a whole though, just for slightly lower xenon consumption for that specific landing, as the takeoff battery mass is set by the valent lander, as nothing uses more batteries than that. During that discussion, Proxima has completed the pole, bop, and dres landings with a very good efficiency, and I'd like to mention another possible micro-xenon optimization. Theoretically, you only need slightly more delta-v to return to the mothership after each landing than to bounce around the moons without returning to the mothership, but this could mean less fuel as you wouldn't be pushing around full xenon tanks for the earlier bodies. I don't really believe this is worth it at this stage, as again, the savings are very minor, and this is only theoretically better, depending on how efficient you are at making gravity cysts. Even slightly suboptimal correction maneuvers could make this not worth it. I am back in the pilot seat for this next set of landings. Elu, Duna, Ike, the Mun, and Mimis are my responsibility, with Elu the first on the list. This mission was launched with a large amount of extra xenon, so especially further along in the mission, we are going to make some less efficient maneuvers to save time in real life. I was extremely busy in real life when the Elu trip started, and I noticed a direct transfer opportunity for only 100 meters per second of delta V, so I took it. Unfortunately, I'd later regret this. This is a lot more than it would take with gravity cysts, but that is a very small mass of xenon overall. The ELU mission proceeds in the standard manner with one ELU gravity assist to correct inclination. On most other planets, this would not be required, as any inclination would be acceptable, but ELU rotates so rapidly that it requires significantly less delta V to land from a prograde equatorial orbit than, say, a polar orbit, as I found on my previous Grand Tour mission. For some reason, my game crashes when lowering my ELU orbit if I don't quick save and quick load beforehand. This doesn't really affect the mission, but I thought I would mention it just to see if it happens to anyone else. A few things happened on this ELU landing. Bill got knocked out of his seat, and for some reason the SAS remained on, so we had the EVA construct the chair to get back in the ship. And I found a really cool service feature, and I was going to plant a flag on top of it, but unfortunately Proxima accidentally left the flag on Dres, so we're flagless for the rest of the mission. Launching off of ELU, the only other major note is that I detached the now unneeded Z400 battery most of the way through the ascent. We ended up having more than enough fuel to go back and pick it up, and it would have been hilarious if we had realized at the time and actually done it. <laughs> Unfortunately, a few things happened once I got to ELU orbit. When selecting a xenon load for this phase of the mission, I took Proxima's estimate and added what I thought was a lot of margin onto it. However, I think this estimate was made with the slightly lighter batteries, and assumed far less corrections for gravity assist than what I could reasonably manage. The direct ELU uh, burn did not help either. This meant I had a very tough time getting back to Tylo. I can do gravity assist just fine to get back to a circular orbit around anywhere, but for this mission the target is in an elliptical orbit, which means that I have to be in an elliptical dual orbit with the right argument of periapsis at just the right spot, uh, which changes based on other orbital parameters. It's very complicated. It took me a few days to find a valid return trajectory, but eventually I found one that would bring me back to the mothership with under 20 meters per second of delta V remaining. Next up is the one in Mimis. The flag isn't required, but makes the arrow breaking logistically easier on my end. The main note here is that future collaborations should play more to the collaborator's strengths. 
In this scenario, I'm pretty good at EVA construction, but I find large amounts of gravity assists difficult and taxing. And for Proxima, it's pretty much the opposite. She would rather do gravity assists over an excessive amount of EVA construction. In this case, the decision to go back to the Kerbin in the middle of the mission was forced due to part routing issues, but I think the decision was made before this was discovered. This led to me later having to do a bunch of gravity assists when I would have much rather unpacked and repacked the craft around Kerbin. I think that the lesson here is that in future collaborations, the save file should be passed around a lot more often in order to best capture every collaborator's advantages. Weirdly enough, I don't think either of us considered that it would be more efficient to do the Millennium Miss landings at the very end of the mission instead of the middle until it was already complete. That's still not as good as doing it at the beginning because you're still pushing around that xenon, but less xenon is probably wasted pushing around that xenon than I wasted doing the gravity assist to get back to Kerbin. <laughs> While I'm bouncing between Kerbin, Jewel, and Duna, I thought I would mention another possible micro xenon optimization. Being more conscious of EVA construction for all of the small ion landers could help a little bit, as ensuring the craft has as close to zero torque as possible on your ion power will mean that less electric charge is being wasted running the reaction wheel. I am unsure how big the savings will be, but it could help in getting closer to saving another tiny battery's worth of mass. The return to Jewel from Kerbin utilizes two Kerbin assists, an EVA assist, and a Duna assist. The return to elliptical tilo orbit from there was much less painful this time, as firstly, I went directly to an elliptical lathe orbit first to make setting things up easier, and secondly I was just lucky with the transfer windows. Delaying the whole mission by at least a week because I couldn't find a solution when returning from ELU was still fresh in my mind, so I made sure to take a full tank of xenon in every segment from here on out just in case I could not find a solution, even though it is slightly less efficient. Next up is Duna. Now here's what was supposed to happen. The craft was supposed to be pre-assembled and able to be flown using MechJeb Smart ASS, and was tuned to have a small amount of margin. However, as mentioned before, a part writing issue forced not only its disassembly, but a permanent decoupling of the MechJab unit and one of the cubic struts. The craft was assembled in the planned orientation at the beginning of the mission, with the Kerbal looking straight upwards, and I was the one who disassembled it. But it was a few weeks between disassembly and reassembly for Duna, so I forgot what it was supposed to look like, and I didn't ask. After the transfer to Duna, which involved a Val assist, a Tylo assist, and an capture, I incorrectly reassembled the Duna lander with the Kerbal facing outwards for less drag. My logic was that if a MechJeb unit was needed in the first place, it was probably because the craft was nearly uncontrollable due to the off-nominal control point, which was chosen to reduce drag. The truth is that it was included to make the more draggy ascent more accurate and precise. This meant that I had completely unnecessarily locked myself into uh, performing that extremely difficult off-nominal ascent without MechJeb. The Duna lander itself is about as simple as you can get. One spider engine, and one dumpling fuel tank, a seat, and four tiny flags used as landing gear. Final orbital insertion is revived by the jetpack with no cylinders. Once again, the jetpack is magic handed. Another very small mass savings is that you only need three flags, uh, or even two if you land on a slope and use the engine as one of the landing legs. However, uh, what Bill ate for breakfast probably influences the mass more than the presence or absence of those two flags, so I won't even bother counting them in the total mass savings. EVA reassembling the lander proved to be a challenge, but one that was surmountable. The hardest part was getting the engine aligned, which came down to a lot of trial and error. As we approached the landing itself, which somehow only took three attempts despite controlling from a sideways facing control point, it is of note that I landed, completely by accident, at a site roughly 4.7 kilometers below sea level. This site isn't even the highest point on Duna's equator, that is over 6 kilometers up, and the highest mountain on Duna is over 8 kilometers up, although it is located 20 degrees north of the equator, so there is likely some improvement that can be gained from landing at and launching from one of those locations. As we come into land, I would like to apologize for the camera orientation. For the ascent, I figured out how to use the nav ball at this orientation, but during the landing I was flying from a locked camera view, still trying to figure out the best way to control this thing. The landing was a bit hard, but Bill survived, although the craft tipped over. I was worried I wouldn't be able to ride it after trying several times and that I would have to try the landing all over again, but a local terrain feature came in handy for riding the craft. Takeoff took several attempts, but the best controls came I was able to find involved attempting to keep the point 90 degrees above the navbell indicator, which I couldn't see, in line with the 90 degree heading marker and not really looking at the craft itself very much. I was able to do it, but it will be much more efficient with MechJeb. It was around this time that I noticed I was doing far better than anticipated with fuel, and it was only 150 or so meters per second short of reaching orbit. I would later figure out that I had unnecessarily made it difficult for myself, as talked about earlier. I briefly attempted to bring the chair along with me as a proof of concept, before realizing it wouldn't fit in my inventory, but in the end I reached orbit with over 3 units of EPA per pound remaining. This opens the door to a number of possible optimizations. The most obvious one is that some of the fuel in the fuel tank could be drained, but I'm not sure that's the best bet here. With a more efficient ascent profile, with the mountaintop landing, and with another landing optimization I'll get to in a second, the craft as it is right now may be able to get to orbit without the jetpack. This would be huge, as the chair, the flags, and the spider engine can all be reused for the EVE lander later on. As we would have to launch one fewer copy of those parts, this would be a liftoff savings of 70 kilograms. 
As for the optimization I said I'd get to in a second, uh, this stems from the fact that the landing bird for the Duna ship takes 25 kilograms of fuel. It is possible to save some of this fuel by rotating Bill's seat to the high drag orientation for landing and rotating it back to the low drag orientation for liftoff. Other landing hardware designed to increase drag may be added, such as an EVA parachute, or litho braking could be attempted with a stack of flags. However, my previous tests using both of these methods proved either unreliable or difficult to control. However, through extra drag or litho braking or a combination of them both, I'm confident that the lighter method of landing this thing can be discovered. The other implication from the landing bird is that launching from the 8 km tall mountain might not be ideal. Ascent delta V will decrease when starting higher up, which is what pretty much everyone has been focused on until now, but descent delta V will increase due to the thinner atmosphere and lower amount of time to slow down. I don't know where the break-even point is, but that is something to look into. Another idea I had just now is that because the jetpack is essentially massless due to magic hand, Bill could push the empty lander back to orbit and recover the mass of the parts that way if the numbers for single stage to orbit do not close. Assuming that, through a combination of these tricks, the Duna lander can be made to single stage to orbit, which I am confident of, at least 70 kilograms can be saved from the total liftoff mass. One of the difficult things about editing a video of this scale is that the amount of time something takes to portray on screen is only slightly correlated to the amount of stuff I have to say about it, so I've been drifting in and out of sync with the video, as there's only so much I can stretch or shrink the footage or my commentary. In this case, while I was talking about Duna, I finished the Ike landing, gravity assisted my way back to Lathe, and gave up on getting back to Tylo, handing off to Proxima a little bit early. Proxima will be completing the remainder of this mission. The rendezvous with the Eve lander is completed, and Proxima performs one of the last major reassemblies of the entire mission, as the parts of the ion chair are transferred over to the Eve lander. She then embarks on a series of gravity assists that will carry the craft towards Eve. The Eve lander was the thing that started this all. Uh, we had both independently reduced the mass of the Eve lander by a few hundred kilograms through a number of different methods before the collaboration even started. When the collaboration did start, we combined our optimizations and eventually reached a final mass of 1,126 kilograms, nearly a ton lighter than the 2.1 ton design used in the previous records. The most consequential optimization was probably the removal of the fairing. While drag on EVE is obviously a tremendous challenge, it turns out that with the mass of the fairing gone, the craft can ascend higher on propellers, which means less drag and less delta V, which means the rocket stage can be lighter, which means the propellers can get higher, and it really is a nice cycle. It is really nice to have a feedback loop go in your favor for once. The other major optimization was seating Bill vertically to reduce drag. Most of the remaining optimizations were a long chain of one of us realizing that something was unneeded due to previous optimizations and resizing the rest of the craft accordingly, wash, rinse, repeat. At one point, the optimal engine for the job was, hilariously, the Cub engine, which, despite its one axis gimbal, actually has more respectable stats than I had given it credit for until then. However, with subsequent changes, eventually the twitch went out. The other optimization of note is the hinge. This doesn't directly save mass, but allows for the propellers to be folded up to reduce the width, and therefore the mass of the initial fairing. Alternatively, it saves mass due to the lower drag of the more streamlined ascent vehicle that would have otherwise had to have been more pancake shaped to fit in the fairing. It also allows everything to be shielded with one flag instead of two. With the advent of EVA constructed propellers, which still sound like a pain, the mass of the hinge can also be saved, although it would be far from my first choice in terms of parts to delete. Deorbit is accomplished using the baseball bat method, which is just enough to reduce the periapsis below the atmospheric limit. Now you notice that the current orbit is 90 by 108 kilometers, and some fuel could be saved by reducing the orbit to just above 90 by 90 kilometers. I believe the rationale for this is that that is approximately the expected orbit, given how high you have to throw yourself to use the EVA jetpack without a lot of gravity losses. But in either case, you could air brake back down, so there may be some mass to be saved by going to 90 by 90. After re-entry, the hinge that deploys the propellers is activated, and landing proceeds normally. Bogus has stretched his legs for a bit before taking off the next day. There is a slight footage discrepancy here. After the film takeoff, it was realized the flag was still there, so the save was reloaded to remove the flag, but the new takeoff was not recorded. After spending ages ascending the propellers, Proxima fires up the two twitch engines on the first stage, in addition to the spider engine on the final stage. When the two dumpling fuel tanks are empty, they are detached along with one of the twitch engines. Proxima has noted that both of the dumplings can be consolidated into a single Oscar B to reduce drag. The next stage is a spider and a dumpling. Bill is positioned beneath the tank for passive aerodynamic stability, but sacrificing this could allow the ejector seat to be used for a small delta V boost. Ascent follows a standard magic can with cylinders profile with 1.53 EVA propellant remaining once orbit is reached. About half of this is used for rendezvous, but theoretically trimming down the rendezvous margins, this is about 150 meters per second that is being left on the table. When this savings is propagated back through the design, this could lead to significant mass savings. The fancy trigonometric usage of the EVA jetpack at different angles also applies here too, if, again, if you are patient enough. However, it is worth noting that the EVE lander is the most annoying lander to optimize. Not only is it the most difficult place to land on and return from in the entire Kerbal system, Unless there is a trick to mitigate this that I am not aware of, in an actual mission, you cannot quick load after you take off as it would cause the propeller to fail. 
That means that you have to wait around an hour before every attempt at the rocket-powered phase of flight, and you can't time warp through that because, you guessed it, it would cause the propeller to fail. Although Proxima has made great progress in making this phase of the flight more consistent, the Eve Lander is usually given more margin than the others for sanity reasons. I'm quite confident we will see a sub-1 ton Eve Lander in the near future, but I can't in good faith claim all of that as certain reductions. The 150 meters per second rendezvous margin corresponds to about 60 kilograms less fuel in the first stage, and conservatively, assuming 15 kilograms of knock-on savings, I can confidently claim that the Eve Lander can lose at least 75 kilograms. As I was talking, Gilly has come and gone, and the last remaining world to land on is Moho, besides Kerbin, of course. At this point, you'll notice that we have a lot of fuel remaining. My previous Grand Tour record, the Magnum Opus 2, is called so because the Magnum Opus 1 reached Eve before a part routing issue doomed it, but it likely would have not had enough fuel to complete the mission, as I had repeatedly fallen short of my optimistic xenon calculations. This instilled a paranoia in me, and both the Magnum Opus 2 and the Wanderer carry a significant xenon surplus as a result. In hindsight, I think having margin was a good idea, but the level of margin was a little bit of an overreaction. As a result of this huge margin, the Moho Leg will use a lot of shortcuts compared to the optimal route, which, if I was flying, would mean no gravity assists, but for Proxima, still means doing several gravity assists. Another thing to note is that the Z1000 battery is still present for quality of life reasons. The optimal route is ditching that and keeping just a Z100 after the final pre-jewel departure landing. This matters significantly at Moho, where the gravity losses are incredibly high, but we have so much fuel left over that it doesn't really matter. At Moho, it is more efficient to use one deployable solar panel because it is lighter than the xenon required to push around all of the batteries from Val. Plus, that solar panel is already needed for the Kerbin ascent. All told, a minimum of three small xenon tanks could be removed without even considering any of the other upgrades I have discussed. This corresponds to 162 kilograms off of the launch mass, depending on how much margin is desired. Back to Moho, landing on the highest mountain on Moho could lead to xenon savings measured in kilograms instead of grams, as for most other micro-xenon optimizations, as Moho rotates slowly, so an equatorial landing isn't super important, and gravity losses are very costly on Moho. Wow, that is a very long run-on sentence. However, the gain pales in comparison to the fluctuation in total xenon use throughout the mission, so any sane pilot will have so much margin to account for that that any small Moho optimizations will not make a difference in the final mass. A millennium and 47 gravities this later, Bill paraglides down to almost but not quite reach a cactus. It is worth noting that the parachute is 4 kilograms of unneeded mass, but I think Bill's spine appreciates the luxury. Across this mission, we've accrued 751 kilograms of liftoff mass reductions, and that's not even counting many of the more nebulous optimizations I have discussed. Messing around in the spaceplane hangar, this should correspond to at least 150 kilograms less fuel in the combined rapier and rocket phases of ascent for a minimum total reduction of 901 kilograms and a new theoretical grand tour mass of 6,818 kilograms. This is well under 7 tons. Only time will tell how low this record will go, but I'm not confident that this will be the last ton barrier to be broken. Maybe we'll see a sub-6 ton grand tour someday. It probably won't be me, though, as this mission has taken enough of my time and I don't anticipate doing anything this big again for a while. I would like to thank Proxima for collaborating with me on this mission and respecting my real-life time constraints that caused this mission to balloon to several months in duration. She has made a music video of this mission on her channel. Link is in the description. Go on and check it out. She has also completed a number of other impressive missions. Go check those videos out as well. The craft file for The Wanderer is also in the description. Additionally, I would like to thank everyone who has ever helped push the low mass records down, as we are all building on each other's discoveries. I hope that our discoveries will get built on as well. Thank you all for watching. Ultimate Steve, out.